Exactly. <laughs> Namaste. Welcome to the Global Summit on Responsible AI for Social Empowerment. Having more than 40 sessions on issues of contemporary relevance related to artificial intelligence, this summit is enriched with an exchange of thoughts from governments, industry, academia, experts, practitioners, policymakers, thought leaders, research scholars, startups, and young minds across the globe. I am Simi Chaudhary, Economic Advisor to the Ministry of Electronics and IT, Government of India, and I am the host for this session today of RAISE that is based on the theme, Unlocking Data for Innovation, Public Services, and Marketplaces. Emerging technologies are now an integral part of every domain of our life today. And across the globe, in the global economy, we are finding that the emerging technologies are significantly impacting the processes and aspirations in critical sectors, be it agriculture, be it education, health, etc. Deployment of these technologies has the potential to disrupt as well as to change the dynamics and delivery models in these sectors, thereby unleashing a huge wave of innovation that can unlock immense value. This digital transformation has the potential to empower the underserved segments of the society across the globe. These technologies have the capability to lead a revolution in governance by delivering speedy and transparent services to citizens, ensuring their participation in governance and empowering them so with a conducive environment to connect and grow through the use of technologies that are affordable, developmental and sustainable. Massive improvement in socioeconomic indicators is possible by transitioning from process centric to platform centric approach with data being at the core of this transition. The volume of data that gets available as a result of the growing digital landscape is expanding exponentially. The onus to constructively use this wealth of data for social and economic benefit for all lies both with the government and the industry stakeholders. Leveraging the predictive power of data will help the governments to transition from reactive to proactive decision-making with targeted focus on areas needing specific interventions. This huge amount of data made available to government and society when processed in a synergized manner within a data ecosystem will produce sector specific and cross sectoral insights, which in turn shall play a vital role to attain the national developmental goals through data driven decision making and thus the sustainable development goals as well. With this, I welcome you all to this session of RAISE on unlocking data for innovation, public services, and marketplaces. We are very privileged to have with us a very distinguished set of experts as speakers in this session. In the beginning, we will have two keynote addresses. Each keynote session will be of 20 minutes each, and that would be followed by a panel discussion of 60 minutes after which the question and answers would be taken up for the remaining 10 minutes. To introduce our first keynote speaker for the session, it's Dr. Rama Akiraju. She is IBM Fellow and CTO AI Operations of IBM Watson. Dr. Rama is a distinguished engineer at the IBM Elmaden Research Center in California. She is one of the drivers of W3C standard on semantic annotations for web services description language and is the editor of the SAW SDL user guide. Dr. Rama is the recipient of multiple best paper awards, including Informs and Decision Sciences Journal Awards. So over to you, Dr. Rama Kiraju. We are really fortunate to be able to share with you the expertise and the thoughts that you have on this very relevant topic of this session. Dr. Rama Akiraju. Thank you so much, Simi. Really appreciate it. I just want to, a small correction. I don't have a doctorate degree. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but uh, let's Rama get started. Akiraju. Yes, yes. Um, 
I'm really excited to share some of the lessons that um, we have learned in the industry in working on deploying AI applications and AI-based solutions for solving real world problems. And I believe that this would be very beneficial. Um, these lessons learned would be very beneficial for public sector as well. So let's get right to it. Can you see my screen okay? Can somebody say? Okay, all right. So AI, I, I, the session topic is more on data. So I will connect uh, all the things that I'm talking about today to data and how data is pertinent and pervasive in all of the things. But let's first take a look at AI and how AI is becoming all pervasive in our lives. We already see AI being an important player in our day-to-day -day lives, be it with our um, cell phones, day-to-day -day interactions within our Google Homes or Alexa. Um, in so many ways, we are using it without even noticing it. In industry too, AI is, is making its mark. You will see it in chatbots as doctor's assistants or nurse assistants or legal advisor flowing through large amounts of legal content and such in social media monitoring, in personalized recommendations that uh, your retail stores are starting to make in self-driving cars, visual recognition, image recognition that is starting to be deployed in various public services areas, including airports and such. And in so many other um, situations, you, you, you see AI being applied in the industry and you can extrapolate it. Several of these are applicable in public services domain as well. So if, for example, if you look at uh, chatbots, very much relevant and applicable in providing citizen services and such. Uh, image recognition, same thing. It's it's a public service um, in airports and uh, other important places to provide security and such. So AI is all pervasive. So I want to kind of motivate by showing a small demo of a chat bot in, an, in, in a customer support type of a scenario. This really brings to the foray, hopefully, what all things need to come together in AI and data behind the scenes to support and to enable the development of these kind of applications. So here it is, a chatbot virtual example. So when I play the video, which goes for about three minutes, I may fast forward it a little bit. What you'll see is that a human is making a phone call for regarding a support, iPhone charger not working or some such situation. And a chatbot is, is receiving the call on the other end. So a chatbot is listening to the speech, that is the questions, the, the conversation that a human is making and is transcribing from speech to text from that understanding the intent of what is the problem that the user is actually having and translate that into is the user happy or unhappy? So what is the sentiment? And based on what the problem is, really go retrieve the corresponding response from, an, from a knowledge repository to quickly help and address that problem. So that is the situation that's going on. You see how many AI systems or AI models have to come together to support this type of a scenario. So I'll playing the video now. Hello, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling about my phone charger issue. It isn't working. Can you help me? My customer ID is one, two, three, four, five, six. Thanks for reaching out. Can you give me some more detail about the issue? When I put my phone for a charge, it just isn't working, which is ridiculous because it's a new charger. I just bought it two days ago. I'm sorry, you're having issues with charging. What kind of charger do you have? It is a charger that came with phone A. It worked on the first day, but stopped working the next day. I see. Sorry to hear that. Let's try a couple of things. If you are using a wall outlet, could you check to see if the wall outlet is actually working by trying to charge something else in it? Let me see. Oh, I think I powered the switch to the wall outlet off by mistake. I just turned the switch on and tried charging. It is working now. Thanks for the tip. Great. Happy to help anytime. Do you need any more help today? No, thanks. Bye now. 
Okay, so let me just kind of walk you through what happened there. So the person is calling. Um, so I was calling in with a phone problem and the system behind the scenes is, this is kind of showing what is happening behind the scenes. It's, it's translated the text, the speech to text and that's the transcript that you see. So it's all happening in real time. So in real time, the audio from the caller got transcribed and the system tapped into the telephone network and transcribed that speech. And that speech is being shown here. And as soon as the user speaks, the system takes this text, is able to process it and say that it's a problem with the phone charger. And the user seems to be unhappy. This is the sentiment. And go and figure out what might be the top things to check for that phone to work. And one of the things typically people do when their charger is not working is they plug it in, but somehow somebody turned the switch on, therefore it's not charging. And um, that happens to be the case here. Check the wall outlet. So that's the, the most prominent recommend recommendation that comes up, or it says remove any debris from the charging port on the bottom of your device, or try a different USB cable charger. So all the commonly applied solutions for the charger problem are automatically brought in because the system recognized that it is a charger problem and brought all those things. So the reason why I wanted to start with this is because it tells you when you deploy an AI application in any situation, industry or public services in this customer support service, it's, it could be in public services domain as well. A, a whole bunch of things have to come together behind the scenes to enable it. And they typically include some of these building blocks. They include either speech to text or text to speech. In this particular case, actually the, the system, when I go back to the demo, the system actually not only retrieved, but is actually converting the text saying, you know, check the wall outlet from text back to speech and it is speaking back in natural language, right? So there is speech to text, there is text to speech and there is natural language understanding, which is that when a text is transcribed from speech, be able to understand that there is actually, there are entities, there is an intent associated with this particular statement that the user just made and what is it and so on. So all of these things had to come together in such a short period of time. And there is a dialogue manager behind the scenes managing the back and forths of what was the question and is there is the answer appropriate and, and all of such, those things. So this is what it takes to bring, and this is just a very small example of tapping into AI for public services or industry, any kind of a scenario. So if you look at what it actually takes to teach AI to do these kind of things for us, you notice that there are, you know, it needs a lot of data. There are many, many AI services, if not all of them are machine learned and data is the fuel, uh, algorithm is the engine. Typically you start with data, you either label data or you take it, if, if it is an unsupervised learning, you don't have to label it, but still you start with data, you prepare the data, you give that data for system to learn either with labels or without labels. And depending on the kind of problem prediction or classification, it takes the labels, and it learns to classify and it starts to make predictions, right? So this is kind of the really the, the starting point for building AI models that is tapping the data to, to, work, to make it work for you to provide analytics. So here is a typical AI model life cycle, right? You, you collect data, you prepare data and it's a whole data management life cycle in itself. Data is not never clean, you have to, clean it, acquire it through proper legal means, enrich it, annotate it, store it, analyze it to make sure you have the right amount of data in right proportions, and you prepare the features. That is, if, if it is textual content, you break it down into the corresponding words um, or phrases and uh, use them as features and using word vectors and those types of things. Um, and if it is speech type of things, you break it down into the phonemes, the sounds, so that you can start to the spectral analysis and those type of things to match it to the known set of phonemes and such. But once the features are prepared, you train a model which learns from those features and the labels that are given, and then you test it on a bunch of test data sets. If, if the accuracy is acceptable, you deploy it and you keep improving that model in production. It's not like a one-time thing. It has to constantly improve. And that's the continuous learning cycle. This is a typical AI model. 
uh, life cycle. So now I want to really kind of get to the core of what are the lessons learned? So there are a set of critical considerations that any organization deploying AI models need to be considering. And I have coined those terms into a mnemonic so that it's easy to remember. It's raise your facts, each letter in race and facts stands for something. So let's take a look at them. I didn't order them. R is for robustness. And then we go through the list of them. Accuracy. So for AI to work for any organization, the models have to be accurate. They have to be continuously learning. They have to be consistently learning. They have to be fair, transparent, and explainable. They have to be accountable, and they have to be robust. So let's go through at least some of these things, given the time that we have, to see what, what actually these things mean. So let's first take a look at accuracy. We took a large amount of data. We are trying to untap. Uh, We're trying to tap into it to unta untangle the, the complexities and to really get insights out of it, right? In, in doing so, the insights have to be meaningful and they have to really mean something to the decision maker. So how do you make sure that the insights that the system came up with or the predictions that it's making are accurate? So first, let's look at the set of metrics that are typically used to measure the accuracy. And these are terms like precision, recall, F measure, mean absolute error, if it is speech, word error rate, sentence error rate, and those sort of things, right? So, okay, so we have, and, and there are formulas for measuring those things. Let's take a look at those. Let's say we built a model. However, it's, let's say it's making mistakes. What do we do? You did the best that you could to collect the data and it's still making mistakes. Here's an example. Take, don't read everything in here. Um, just look at the, the piece of text on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. This is a, um, a healthcare domain content. So a doctor's speech, doctor is speaking into a system and it's recording doctor's notes, making it easy for doctor to record notes. And uh, in doing so, in doing the speech tran transcribe transcription, it made some mistakes. So the one that are highlighted in red are the mistakes that it made. The one that are in this uh, brick color are all things related to healthcare domain. So these are vocabulary related to healthcare domain. So it's not so bad. It got most of it right, but you can see instead of saying lower sternum, it, it transcribed it as lower stardom instead of recording the protein as troponin, it recorded at pros, proponent and so on. Acute coronary syndrome has been transcribed as good con or syndrome, which is somewhat meaningless. However, and this is from, the, from a regular uh, speech to text system that has not been special purpose trained for healthcare domain. Whereas if you now take this and train it with some vocabulary, pertaining to healthcare. And this means is that the key point that I want to make is that AI systems, when you build them with the solving it for the bigger problem of broader AI is a much harder problem. If you narrow the domain, you can get much more higher success and higher accuracy rates. And it's absolutely okay. There is no shame in solving point problems in with AI, with the data that you have. And another insight that we got from it is that you can start with a general purpose problem solution, general purpose model, which is which we call as base model. It may not be the best in the world, but then you take that on top of it, you start narrowing it by bringing in more industry specific data and customer specific or a particular use case specific data. And it starts to really improve and you can see that with smaller amounts of training data, you can get to the same levels of higher precisions that you would typically want by narrowing the domain. So this is a very, very important insight that we got early on as we were trying to solve problems and really get the potential that you could from tapping into data with AI. So the summary of the the accuracy strategy is build broad-based models, take whatever data you have as a good starting point that ensures decent coverage, 
But then to really improve accuracy and get to the levels that it needs to be, like in the case of speech example that I had shown, where initially it was like 70%, 80% accurate to get it to 90% accuracy plus and so on, you need to narrow the domain and accelerate the learning and build AI models so that they can be customized by consumers of those models. That is, the models have to provide the application programming interfaces so that you can supply that additional delta data to it and the model can learn on top of the base model that it already has. And it is possible to do that these days with the, with the kinds of technology that's available um, with transfer learning techniques and such. It's important to make such interfaces available through these AI, to these AI models so that people can get the benefit of training them. So I will just take one or two more um, to talk about it, continuous learning. Now, on day one, any AI model is not going to be perfect. It's, it's going to make mistakes. Similar to how when a child is learning to play, uh, to ride the bike, you know, this child will fall down several times. But then you learn, you, you get the tricks and you get better at it and you get the balance and, and you're off. Um, uh, same thing here with AI models, they need to be continuously improving. Um, so that is, this is showing a continuous improvement life cycle. Basically, for every model prediction that it makes, you need to classify it into whether it's a correct prediction or an incorrect prediction, either with a human input or eventually with an automated model. And for every incorrect prediction that makes, that is important to you to fix. Do very typical, very, very traditional error analysis, very disciplined error analysis and figure out why it's making a mistake and improve it. You know, the analogy that I like to think of is that similar to how when a child gives a, when a kid is, you know, taking a test and, um, and makes mistakes in specific concepts, you want to really go and tackle those concepts by giving more examples to that kid before the kid goes and takes the next, next, the, the same test again, be it with say fractions or uh, exponentials or uh, um, uh, linear equations, whatever the case may be, you focus on those areas where the kid has con understand lack of understanding of concepts and go back and um, help the, the kid take the test again to get better results. Same concept applies for AI models as well. So the strategies for continuously improving the accuracy of AI model, I would say, is you be diligent with error analysis, fix the problems and make sure that you are focusing on the ones that are important to you and uh, wherever applicable, focus on those specific problem areas by building micro models if you have to. Now, fairness is an important and an interesting one. I'll talk about this and then I may, um, in the interest of time, conclude it. Fairness comes up often in, um, um, in, in, in uh, popular media, right? So when AI models make mistakes that touch human lives or, or humans' well-being or their financial health, there are several more considerations than normal AI models that you have to worry about. So there's a lot of uh, um, uh, reputation damage for the person who was wrongfully accused that that was not the person. Indeed, the, the facial recognition software made a mistake in recognizing the person's face because the original video from which that was done was blurry. So increasingly as AI is being applied to specific scenarios such as this where people's well-being health and those kind of things are at um, are at uh, risk it's the, the fairness of AI models becomes such a big concern now the fairness and bias aspects you know as such biases by itself is not bad algorithms in you know, a statistical definition bias is good but typically what we're trying to avoid is undesirable bias and the undesirable bias is specifically stemming from the kind of data that you feed into the system. So if you don't feed in or if you don't label the data and if you don't have the right kind of um, proportions of uh, labels of data going into the AI models that you are preparing, then of course those biases will carry on. They could come from having not having a clear goal that I need to make sure that I have enough representation of everything um, that I'm trying to predict or that I don't have the right kind of data. I do, therefore, this is not ready for prime time. So it could, this bias can creep in at any part of an building of an AI model. Um, so I'd like to say, you know, if, you know, when you don't know where you're going, every road gets you there. Um, uh, you know, as the quote says, the point here is that you have to have clear goal for an AI model that you know, if it has to recognize these these types of faces, 
with this much accuracy, then you need this much this much data and this this kind of test cases and ensure that you have that. So that hand, that kind of clarity of goal is absolutely goal setting is absolutely necessary in order to avoid un, unwanted biases. Otherwise, when you deploy these kind of AI models in 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 public services, especially these could backfire for for the organizations that are deploying them if they are biased based on age, gender, race, geography, or those kind of things, or even any kind of other um, things that may come up like the political parties or uh, a particular person who lives in a particular geography or a place, any number of things, attributes can come up upon which biases could creep in. So in AI, there are many de-biasing techniques that will help you first identify where the biases might be coming from, given a set of attributes that you're interested in and help you de-bias those things in your data so that you can prepare more right kind of data and proportional and representative data for, for teaching AI models to be fair and free of unwanted bias. So I will just touch upon the rest of the concepts without going into the details of it. Transparency and explainability, of course, is exceptionally important. It, it is, um, if you are building a black box system that cannot explain why it made a prediction, why does it thinks that, uh, um, you know, this person should be accepted for a loan or this person should be rejected for a loan and it comes up for any kind of uh, audit, it's a, it's a huge problem. So building models that are transparent and explainable is critical. And again, there are many AI techniques that are available uh, these days in, in, uh, with academics and uh, industry um, contributions that can be used for providing more explanations of AI models, even be it with rules or be it with um, um, models that are learned with deep learning where things can after the fact be explained if not exactly you know, everything that happened in the way the neural network is constructed. So um, statistical machine learning models may forget what they learned, and this is going to consistency part of it, right? So the next part of it is transparency is good, but consistency is also important. You, you go from one, met, one learning cycle to another learning cycle, and in the process, it shouldn't unlearn what it has learned correctly before. And you cannot guarantee it when you're building statistical models because you know data is data and it's learning from data. And it could, in some situations, it could lead to a lot of problems when it, when a user has corrected a model saying, here's a problem, you, you corrected it, it fixed it, but then in the next iteration, the same problem comes back. So similar to transparency, explainability, being consistent with the ability to learn is important. And depending on the use case and the domain, you may want to uh, specifically choose the right kind of algorithm. Um, oh, my screen sharing is closed, window is... I don't know if it was intentional, but I will get back to it and I will wrap it up. Can you see, I hope you can see my screen again. So accountability, yes, yeah, accountability um, and drift. I'll just um, kind of skip over these things to summarize. These are all imp very important considerations when you are building AI models, right? Accountability is basically all about making sure that everything that the model is doing is being documented and there is a lineage and provenance associated with it. What data did you train it on? What um, predictions did it make? How many were correct? How many were incorrect? And what mistakes did it make? And how did you improve the model the next time around? What additional data did you provide? All of that is very important because without um, that, you don't know if you're going if you're in if they're going in the right direction or not, if you're improving or not. Robustness is is uh, AI model when you put it out there is very much susceptible to to attacks of all kinds. Therefore, while building itself, providing enough opportunity to the models to um, see those adversarial examples that may pop up is also very important. So this includes things like, you know, an image could when you tilt it, it could look like a completely different thing. You know, a dishwasher may look like a microwave, or a dishwasher may look like a um, uh, you know, washer dryer or a speaker, uh, any number of things could happen. So, and people try to manipulate systems um, with uh, um, those kind of people being people and, and uh, uh, bad actors being bad actors, all of those things are very much possible. Therefore, in building AI models, 
giving them those adversarial examples where you yourself prepare all those counter examples and, and make sure that the model learns from it and doesn't get tripped is important. So let me now summarize for making AI to work for any organization, not only industry, any kind of public services domain, I posit that it needs to be accurate, continuously learning. It needs to be fair, transparent, consistently improving, accountable, and robust. And if we, if we can take these things into consideration and build AI models with the strong foundations, then you can be assured that you are deriving the value from the data and putting AI to use for specific use cases, be it a chatbot use cases in public services domain, or be it uh, you know, image recognition, or you know, loan approval in uh, um, uh, uh, banks, whatever the case may be. So let me pause there. Um, that that's pretty much kind of the summary of my talk, and see if there is. Uh, I don't think we have time for questions, so I guess that's the end of it. Back over to you, Simi. Thank you. And thanks Mr. for the opportunity, raised for re, yeah for this um, for, for the session and for for allowing. No, me it was speak. a pleasure to have you here, and uh, we're really thankful to you for putting forth uh, such good, elaborate, comprehensive information and the well-defined contours related to the theme of today's session. And that really sets the context for me in inviting the next keynote speaker for this session, Dr. Xu Dong Huang. Let me introduce Dr. Huang to everybody who's joined with us today here. Dr. Huang is a technical fellow and CTO, AI Cognitive Services, Microsoft. He is overseeing Azure AI Cognitive Services, Engineering and Research, covering Microsoft's core perceptive and cognitive AI pillars, which are computer vision, speech, natural language, and decision. He helps to bring the dream of making machines see, hear, speak, and understand human beings, a reality that has been created with his passion for technology, innovation, and social responsibility. He's recently led Microsoft's AI teams achieving multiple groundbreaking human parity milestones in transcribing conversational speech. So over to you, Dr. Shirong Huang. We would be really privileged to hear your thoughts on the theme for the session today. Dr. Huang, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Huang, we can hear right. you. It's my great honor to be here. And um, let me just actually turn on one of the features in Microsoft product. Uh, you know, if you use a PowerPoint, you can actually uh, translate everything you have into whatever languages you want. So I'm going to translate my English into Hindi in real time. So um, today, I'm going to talk about how we're going to use AI for everyone on this planet to help them achieve more. Before I start, I want to share with you some of the greatest effort we are doing um, we just added SMEs in translation for Microsoft Azure AI services. This was turned on just a few days ago, last week. So I'm always fascinated with uh, the richness of language in India. Of course, we are working to help to close the barrier to help everyone communicate better. Another example I want to talk about before I start is uh, in the European Union, they spent a year to evaluate international systems, over 15 systems. They finally decided to pick up three winning systems in phase one. They evaluated the live translation of English, German, and French. And Microsoft system was the highest quality among all the international bidders. So, European Union selected Microsoft together with other two systems in the phase two. So the phase two, we actually evaluated 10 languages in the European Union, eventually expand to 24. As a matter of fact, Microsoft is the only company that provided all 24 languages today. So even if you want to wait for another year or two to evaluate the quality, Microsoft Azure services already offer the capability for the European Union Parliament to debate in live translation of all 24 languages. So I want to show you a short video before I start my talk. 
Frau Präsidentin, liebe Kollegen, liebe Kolleginnen, ich möchte meinen ganz herzlichen Dank an die Berichterstatterin Katrin Seiler aussprechen, die in diesem hochtechnischen Bereich eine sehr wichtige Arbeit gemacht hat. Denn es ist nicht nur ein technischer Bericht, es ist auch ein hochpolitischer Bericht, den wir vor uns liegen haben, einen in dem hohe politische Standards auch respektiert werden mussten. Es ging darum, die Belange der Wirtschaft, der Sicherheit, des Arbeitsschutzes miteinander in Einklang zu bringen. Und es ist ihr aus Sicht des Europäischen Parlaments und der Sozialfrau Präsidentin, liebe Kollegen. So, that is the live Microsoft System providing live translation of three languages in European Parliament, phase one. And if they want to turn on 24 languages, we can turn that on immediately. I know for the country like India, there are over 10 languages spoken. We have been working with um, GEO to deliver that services on a set-top box today. Um, we are excited. We have the ability and the services to really help everyone on this planet to communicate better, to achieve more. So our dream is really about extending human capability to make humans see communicate, speak, understand better. So our breakthrough on the AI is really powered by three core pillars. Azure is the largest computing superpower in the, on the planet today. We are able to really leverage Azure cloud services to deal with massive amount of data and with powerful algorithms, we can really bring the dream of AI to the reality. Um, on the algorithm, I want to really share some foundational vision we have at Microsoft Azure AI. Our quest to universal representation is really the foundational piece. The downstream AI is all built on top of this. So you can start with the text. Um, to map the natural language into embedding space has been well known as exemplified by Google's BERT. As a matter of fact, Microsoft has been doing this Xcode several years before BERT. We are embedding everything into this semantic space we call Xcode. This was a shift as part of Bing services for the web search. In our pursuit of speech and the OCR form recognition, we also identified that it's actually very powerful to jointly explore both text and the pixel in the case of OCR. For speech recognition, it's very powerful to explore the joint intersection of a speech and the text. So that inter intersection of X and Y, that modality could be speech or image or video is extremely powerful. When we are shipping translation for India languages, we have found that by combining like 10 or so languages together to jointly explore that uh, multilingual space through transfer learning is super powerful. So, you know, quest of um, general artificial intelligence, we believe that the intersection of X, Y, Z is the foundational piece. That's what the Azure AI is going to build on. So this is what we call XYZ code. So through that vision on XYZ code, Microsoft in the last five years, have uh, we have achieved uh, five remarkable human parity in the research open benchmark. I want to really highlight that those are the research benchmark, not wide open AI tasks. So most recently we, achieve the image captioning human parity on the open novel object challenge. This was sponsored by Facebook. Um, before that, we had the conversation Q&A on the Stanford COCOA benchmark. And the machine translation, this was a WMT Chinese to English news translation. And uh, remarkably on the switchboard, that has been the task worked by the community for over 20 years we were the first to reach human parity in transcribing conversational speech in 2017. Most of those human parity breakthrough got incorporated into Azure Cognitive Services. So as a developer or organization, you can build on the success of Microsoft's 30 years of research on artificial intelligence. So the best form to really 
illustrate Microsoft's AI capability is through our Azure Cognitive Services. This is the most comprehensive state-of-the-art AI product today, widely open for the global developers. There are four core pillars in the Azure Cognitive Services. From perceptive intelligence, we have speech and vision. This includes speech recognition, speaker recognition, and the neural text to speech. On the computer vision, we have face recognition, form recognition, and real-time computer vision. And the language, we offer a wider range of services from translation to text analytics to Q&A maker. And on the decision AI, we offer the business-related decision such as personalization, anomaly detection, and uh, metrics advisor. Across those four pillars, there's actually a common theme. It was a trained with a large, massive deep learning model hosted on Azure. We also understand it's very important to customize, even with a large pre-trained model, it's not powerful enough. So if you are a customer, you can really just take the Microsoft Azure AI model and uh, upload your own data, customized for your own needs. Those data are preserved by you. Even Microsoft has no access to the data you upload to Azure. So whether it's a speech or translation or computer vision, you can upload your own data, create your own Azure endpoint to serve your customers better. So that's really an overview, high level summary of Azure Cognitive Services. I wanna show a few demos about how those services can be used to really help customers throughout the world. So this is actually a quick demo you can see if you have a, a mask, it's green. If you don't, it's red. So this was deployed in the organization to really help to fight COVID-19. So the second one is really a powerful um, meeting transcription services that is coming to Teams. See here, this is a common office meeting room. But this one's different. On the desk, see here, this is a common office meeting room, but this one's different. On the desk, we have a prototype device that picks up both audio and video that we can couple with AI services in Microsoft 365 to help with key tasks like identification, voice transcription, and even real-time translation. So let's go ahead and get started. Dave, what's the latest with the smart building pilot? I've already done some preliminary analysis on the data, but I'm finding some high temperature outliers. Let's discuss it later in the meeting. Okay, sounds good. Dave, do we have enough of the ANSI multisense just to update the showcase floor? Actually, I have some concerns about the placement of those showcase sensors, and we should hold off on a one-to-one -one replacement until oh, I can- I'm really sorry to interrupt, Dave, but I have some ideas about the replacement. So maybe let's connect after the meeting. That's good to know. I'll follow up with my team and I'll post an update to our channel after the meeting. And I'll take the action to send Yanzi an email about those showcase sensors. Okay, great. Now, take a look at the transcript behind me on the left. Even though we were all speaking over each other, the AI services coupled with the audio and video signals from the device could still accurately identify who was speaking and when. You'll also notice that it picked up our meeting items and listed them on the right. And the voice recognition model has been trained over time to understand our team's unique communication style and recognizes our speech patterns even when we're speaking in business jargon. This not only helps the interactions in the meeting room, but it helps remote participants have a more active meeting experience. Our remote teammate in China can see and hear a translation of this meeting. In fact, we can support multiple simultaneous translations. So that is, those two demos illustrate how people throughout the world can take advantage of Azure AI and really help them achieve more. Um, before I close, I want to talk about the fairness and um, the gap of AI. There were two independent studies. Um, you know, in 2018, MIT researchers published this paper about the facial recognition bias. 
So they studied multiple companies from IBM to Microsoft to Face++ in China. You can see that there's really um, a large gap about the people with darker skin color. Uh, even though Microsoft had a good result, but Microsoft still had uh, a sizable gap. So we have been working to close the gap by really creating the data that are more diverse, less biased. Uh, so facial recognition Microsoft today has much better quality in dealing with people with color, color and uh, gender differences. Um, this year, Stanford published another study about the speech recognition. As you can see on the table here, they examined the, all the industrial players from Amazon to Microsoft. Um, so the, the graph here is the error rate. The lower, the better. Even though Microsoft had a small gap, but still Microsoft speech system had um, a gap between the black and the white. So those biases does exist. We are trying to close the gap as aggressive as we can um, when we deliver the services to the world. So that is really the end of the conversation. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Wong. It was very interesting, very insightful and enables lot many stakeholders to draw many lessons in the domain of natural language processing, AI, data analytics, all put together. It uh, really imbibes a sense of uh, a realization that yes, dreams can turn into reality and we can break down the language barriers to truly create a global world, global village or a global economy, whatever we may call it. So we now move over to the panel discussion. And apart from Dr. Wong, we also have with us here Sangeeta Gupta, Senior Vice President, NASCOM, who leads a number of key initiatives at NASCOM focusing on industry research, outreach, events, communications, as well as strategic priorities for NASCOM. She possesses skills in business planning, business intelligence, business development, brand management, and business process outsourcing. Today, Sangeeta Guptaji will be acting as the moderator for the panel discussion with us here. Other members in the panel include Dr. Bala Raman Ravindran. Dr. Ravindran heads the Robert Bush Center for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence at IIT Madras. He is the Mind Tree Faculty Fellow and Professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology in Chennai. He has more than two decades of research experience in AI, ML, and specifically reinforcement learning. Currently, his research interests span the areas of reinforcement learning, complex networks, and geometric deep learning. He has been recognized as a senior member of the Association for Advancement of AI for his longstanding contributions to the domain. With a large number of publications in journals and conferences, Dr. Ravindran is just the right person to have on the panel in the theme today. We also are privileged to have with us Mr. Srikanth Velamakani, CEO of Fractal. Srikanth Velamakani ji is the co-founder, group chief executive and executive vice chairman of Fractal, one of the leading players in artificial mm -hmm. intelligence and digital transformation. He's also the co-founder and trustee of Plukshare University with a strong academic focus on core engineering, AI, ML, and mathematics. Additionally, he is a member of the NASCOM Executive Council and he serves as a subject matter expert on data and AI. So welcome to all the panelists once again and over to you, Sangeeta, for a very you know, enriched panel discussion that we sure are going to have today with such distinguished panelists with us in the session. Sangeeta. Thank you so much, Simi, and a very, very warm welcome to all the participants who joined this session. Um, I'm honored to have three leaders as my panelists. Uh, each of them are doing some pioneering work in the field of AI and data. And my objective would be to make this session as interactive and engaging as possible. 
I would encourage our participants to post the questions on the app and you know, we will try and answer as many of the questions as we can. Uh, the topic of our panel is unlocking data for innovation, public services and marketplaces. Uh, if you've been attending the race conference over the last two, three days, uh, I think the importance of data and AI has been highlighted at multiple sessions. In fact, the prime minister in his inaugural address talked about how India, which is already a leader in the whole field of technology services, should aim to become a global powerhouse for AI. So clearly, I think the opportunity is right. We are at the right juncture. And events like the RACE platform create an opportunity for different stakeholders to come together and help us to build uh, initiatives, perspectives to, to realize this vision. I'll give a very brief introduction to some of the work NASCOM has been done and hand this over to my panelists uh, post this. Uh, we recently published a detailed report with McKinsey and Company that highlighted that data and AI can almost unlock $500 billion value for India and can play a key role for India's economic recovery and aid uh, recovery from the current crisis that we are going through. This unlock value can come from building an effective data utilization strategy across key verticals. For example, in agriculture, we estimated that almost 60 to 65 billion value can be unlocked. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, 2020 being the year of the pandemic, I thought let's go for an example. Let's tell you a story about what happened when the first time data was used to unlock innovation. In 18, the year is 1854. During those days, cholera was a big epidemic and a pandemic, in fact, and London as a city, for example, was losing millions of people every year because of uh, cholera. And the general idea was that it is spread by air, miasma or bad air. And what they didn't realize was London, the city of London was dumping its sewage in the Thames River. And it was causing this, this huge cholera epidemic and uh, unfortunately, no one, no one knew how to solve for it. John Snow, for the first time, looked at data, figured out that here's a pump, Broad Street pump, and people who are actually drinking water from that pump are actually uh, more likely to get sick, and therefore that could be a source of the infection. He established this in 1854. Uh, unfortunately, the city authorities took 12 more years to fix this problem, but 1866, when they cleaned up the rivers, that's when the, the cholera epidemic went over. So data, even back in 150, 170 years ago, was a very important weapon to unlock, understand, and, and fix problems. Uh, now let's, let's turn back to 2020. A few months back, in June 2020, United Airlines, with, who has this very popular mileage plus, uh, mileage plus program, loyalty program, borrowed $5 billion. As you know, airlines are having a hard time these days. So it decided to eventually borrow against its frequent flyer program. The frequent flyer program itself was deemed to be worth $20 billion. You may have heard that there are many airline companies whose frequent flyer program is more valuable than the airline itself. But data in, in this case was the strategic asset because of which United was able to borrow $5 billion uh, by mortgaging or keeping in against the receivables from the, the frequent flyer program. So data is really, really valuable, right? And data can unlock serious productivity gains, serious innovation, and solve India's growth challenge. Now let's look at what is India's growth channel challenge, right? If you look at the last 50 years, world economies have grown by three and a half percent every year on an average because of employment growth and productivity growth. It's been 50-50. Half of it was because of employment growth and productivity growth. All growth eventually is a function of these two kinds of growth. India is in the next few years is going to generate 91 million people and add to them to the workforce. 91 million by, by 2030. It's one of the biggest net suppliers of talent to the world. right? And just to employ these 91 million people and keep the same unemployment rate, India will need to grow by an average 8.5% over the next between FI23 and 30. Right? Essentially, it means employment growth, maybe about 1.5% per year, which has been our best, best performance over the last uh, decade or so. That's the kind of best case performance we can expect to get capacity, understand hospital capacity, and predict uh, how many hospital beds be, will be required, how many ICU beds will be required, how many healthcare workers will be required, what kind of 
protective personal protective equipment or ventilators may be required these kinds of projections were possible and we saw that across many states in the country by unlocking the publicly available data uh, and the data coming from icmr and the tests we could really improve the overall healthcare outcomes one specific example i'll talk about is in karnataka where we started looking at um, how, at accelerating a patient's move from the time she or he gets detected with covid to getting into a hospital now uh, getting to hospital or an institutional quarantine center we had to make some very critical decisions from the time a test turned positive and the goal for us was how can we reduce that time from many hours and even a couple of days sometimes to 2 hours by digitally connecting the data pipelines that across the whole range of services that karnataka had we could bring that time down to 2 hours so the time somebody gets directed to a decision on what kind of a hospital which is the nearest hospital maybe perhaps which is the one that has a ventilator which is the one that has oxygen supply uh, which is the one uh, or just a institutional quarantine center what is the exact decision on that patient at that point of time and even dispatch the right ambulance and pick up the patient and bring the patient to the that that facility those kinds of things we could do because we could connect a whole range of data sources now think of that in the pandemic context certainly it is very very uh, powerful but think of that in a general context india has 1.3 billion people who have very you know whose healthcare needs will continue to expand we have a healthcare system that's already quite overburdened if we can if we can connect all these data data sets and create a national health platform we can really dramatically improve the healthcare outcomes for the country and decrease healthcare costs now i want to move out uh, move uh, we are we are extremely sorry we are again facing issues uh, we are ex- we are very extremely sorry uh, no issues back in team just tell us uh, over here announce over here when we are live again and this time we'll refrain from chatting amongst ourselves we'll wait for you to prompt okay ma'am we are extremely sorry once again i think some uh, little excerpts of our earlier chat were probably the just just the fact and probably uh was caught and we had immediately gone live at that time okay ma'am it will be interesting to see how we stitch this presentation together afterwards you should share it with them and probably they can uh, put it in from their side and sangeeta we will go beyond 9 pm a bit so that everybody can be covered in the right manner i thought we'd focus on you know three four questions and then ha, i think ha, dr juan okay. uh, also has a yes. sharp cut off right so Uh, but our other speakers should get the right time. Yeah, I also have a night meeting. Oh, okay, it's online now.
every year uh, due to road accidents. Um, there are about 9,000 black spots that have been identified by the government of India across the country on national highways. These are spots where predictably many accidents happen, many fatal accidents happen. And what we what we started doing along with some infrastructure players is to analyze these 9,000 black spots. And each of those nine, each of the 9,000, some of them we have been able to analyze. And what we've been able to do is to create not just understand from, from using video feeds of the cameras from there, and also the data on these accidents, what we've been able to find out is why these accidents may be happening, and two, create design systems to reduce the frequency of these accidents. So we, an, an example would be to create a, a kind of a zebra, zebra line, uh, which where the distance between the zebra lines actually reduces as you, as you cross that spot. What it makes you feel is that you're accelerating. It creates a visual illusion of acceleration, which prompts in turn to make you break, right? That reduces the speed and reduces the frequency of accident. That's just one of the solutions, but a whole range of different design solutions, knowing these spots, analyzing what kind of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, driving behavior is leading to them using you know, computer vision, and then designing those solutions, we've been able to reduce road fatalities in the spots that we have identified by 50%. Just imagine if we could do this across the country, uh, the 150,000 could may, may reduce by to 75,000 a year. And that's that's saving 75,000 lives every year. That can dramatically accelerate progress and dramatically improve India's productivity as well. The last example I want to give you is that of predictive maintenance. India has a great uh, you know railway infrastructure. Um, in, by the way, in, even in India, in Mumbai, in the city of Mumbai alone, ten people die every day because of road because of train accidents. Uh, but just not just that, we we analyzed uh, what is called as journey reliability for transport for London by looking at the data coming out from uh, from the sensors of these trains. We could identify that the most delays actually happen because one of the most you know, important reasons for delay is doors malfunctioning, especially in London, London Tube. By analyzing the sensor data coming from the doors, we could actually predict which doors are likely to fail and improve the overall journey reliability. That's a measure that the Transport for London measures. Imagine doing that across the railway system of India uh, to create predictive maintenance solutions so that we have fewer train accidents, we have fewer train delays, again, improving India's productivity and, and unlocking innovation and growth. So these are some of the ideas that I, I just wanted to tell you uh, from my side. Uh, if, if I could just uh, summarize or even think a little bit longer term, what will drive India's innovation in the next 20 years? If you take a really long-term view, I believe education is one of the key. Education is the one way in which we can improve productivity across the country. And today, AI education could be one of them. One of my so recommendations to the government of India would be to create five key AI courses and make it free for every single person in the country, right? We can also use AI to drive educational outcomes because nowadays by actually measuring how people learn and, and the, you may have heard of the flipped classroom model where you do classwork at home and homework in, in, uh, homework in, in school by, by actually measuring where students are failing to learn and where they're getting stuck we can actually improve education outcomes as well. But education is one area where we can use AI, we can teach AI and use AI to improve educational outcomes. I think that is one of the most important ways in which we can improve the overall outcomes. Have that eight and a half percent growth rate will only happen through education. Second is entrepreneurship. In the long term, we need great ideas, great entrepreneurs. Great entrepreneurs create great businesses that drives overall economic growth. And how do we create ecos? circumstances for economic growth, how do we create that entrepreneurship within India? Trust. Trust is the currency in which the country works. Think of credit bureaus. Before there were credit bureaus, the overall lending was based on uh, statistic, some kind of understanding of the customer's borrowing capacity. Once you have a credit bureau, it gives you information on whether the customer is borrowing and paying back on time. That kind of a national infrastructure of data created by a credit bureau has, it, has, it has been shown across the world. It, it increases the trust in the economy, increases the overall lending rate. It, lending rate has in, in, increased the overall disbursement of loans, and it increases the economic growth rate of the economy in the long term. But there are other ways in which we can create trust and transparency. One of the, one of the proposals I have is 
to make every single piece of data set that the government of india owns which is not personalized to make it free by default there should be a good reason for data to be not transparent by creating this transparency of the government how does government spend money how does government uh, what are the ways in which we can create data sets that show the effective governance of the country but also increase the trust levels and increase the econ economic growth rate in the in the long term and last and most important is to create the infrastructure whether it's healthcare whether it's road safety whether it's roads we have to create infrastructure eventually in investment in infrastructure is the only way in which we can create uh, all the other three pillars can can actually work only when there is solid infrastructure for growth so with those thoughts i'll i'll hand it back to you sangeeta thank you so much uh, shrikant it's very very insightful uh, use cases uh, i now request professor ravindran to share his initial remarks and then we'll move to the interactive q and a session sure thank you sangeeta and thank you sevi for uh, hosting the panel and uh, so i'll be quick uh, in my opening remarks so that we have time to uh, discuss some of the questions right so uh, remember that the theme of the uh, the whole uh, conference is on responsible ai for social empowerment right so we really have to think what is it that we are enabling when we unlock data so let me give you an example Right. So, so we were doing some very interesting work on looking at Indian traffic scenario. Right. So, a lot of automated, uh, you know, traffic counting mechanisms and detection tools and other things are all available. Right. People have done tremendous work, but using data that comes predominantly from uh, the Western world. Right. So, the the variety of cars and the vehicles that are there in the Indian roads are very different. You know. So, so it's it's not. Uh, Uh, uh immediately obvious that something that is trained on uh, western traffic would work on india right so we basically tried to build the indian database and then we found that uh, using uh, even very very small amounts of the indian data we were able to get extremely good performance okay and then we decided that we want to make this data public whatever we had gathered and then uh, we had some discussions with a colleague who was familiar with you know the ethical aspects of experimentation so he came from the biosciences because computer science people never worry about all these ethical issues before uh, now right so we talked to a colleague from the biosciences and he said hey all of this is great you have been using the data for counting the different kinds of vehicles and estimating traffic density and travel times and so on and so forth but do you realize that in a good fraction of the frames that the license plate of the vehicles are visible right so did you get permission from the owners of the vehicle to make public the fact that their vehicle was on the road at this stretch of the highway at this time of the day obviously we never thought thought of that nobody thought of that right and now if i start putting this data out what if somebody starts using this information you know uh, to to you know, track people to figure out where somebody was at a particular point of time right so whenever we start talking about unlocking ai even even though we we don't even the, the issues that come up are so subtle right so we have to really worry about what is it that we are enabling right when we unlock data right so that is something that we have to think about right i mean i i completely agree with all the points that she can so we need access to data right in order to you know build better services in order to empower uh, people and so on and so forth but there is this flip side to it and there is this whole responsible use of data part to it right and i i don't have a ready made answer to this right maybe there is a policy issue here maybe that is a algorithmic issue here and in fact people have looked at all kinds of algorithmic tricks for uh, pre preserving privacy and so on and so forth and it is basically a arms race and it's not like uh, you know you you do you, there is a there is a silver bullet for your, your privacy issue it's always an arms race you come up with ways of protecting data uh, and then there's somebody else would come in and uh, uh, you know try to uh, take something out of it that you didn't think was possible so this is one part of it okay? the second part of uh, the the responsible uh, ai comes in whenever i want to unlock data in in kind of a market pl place like scenario where i'm going to make the data available for others to use right so let us take an example that uh, shrikant was talking about in terms of you know financial behavior of people right looking i want to build a credit risk model and so etc right 
and uh, so we know that the government has in, uh, launched many 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 schemes to help the rural poor right uh, and uh, they have been targeting uh, uh, a lot of these schemes for them and uh, uh, consequently there is a lot of data available for the rural poor now suppose i finally convince the government to anonymize the data and release it for people to build financial services or credit score predicting mechanisms using that data do we know how well it will perform on urban poor right. so you might claim that the data is very representative because it has data from 12 states and distributed geographically around the country right is it really representative enough is there a way that i can attach a certificate to the data right saying that this is this is exactly what is contained in the data and if you use it for building various services and these are the things that you should watch out for and is it even possible for us to come up with such a listing a priori right what are the potential i mean we are talking about innovation here right so we really want people to use the data in ways that we didn't think about right and then we, we so so again responsible use of ai data right uh, uh, brings up a lot of these very subtle questions right which we really need to think about uh, uh, before right uh, we say that data should be put on the marketplace or or data should be made freely available for people to build their own applications on top of it it is i'm taking a slightly contrarian view to what uh, people normally say right so yeah data should be made freely available etc etc but now actually looking at some of the data that we have been working with for almost two close to two years right the traffic data that we had stuck with was close to two years and uh, and we had actually made presentation we have presented it to audiences running into a couple of hundreds no one came up with that idea until this one colleague from biosciences said hey number plates are identifiable information they're not visible on all the web frames or some frames right so now it becomes a little challenging because So I'm going to stop here. So I just brought up a controversial point in the opening remark itself, but I'll leave it to you, Sangeeta, now to bring up some questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ravindran. I think it's a very, very important point that while we're talking about access to data, we need to equally think about how representative it is. You last last thing you really want is that you build algorithms on top of that data that will create more bias and more uh, disparity than already exists. Um, and and start my questions. Um, with dr huang you know if you can switch on your video uh, my first question was really for you on saying you know you've worked across multiple countries and you've seen uh, you know how data and ai can unlock value in different countries can you tell us a few examples that really stood out for you and you know what what in these could be replicable for india yeah the, this is a great question the data is really the oxygen for ai and uh, let's just take the us as example right we have um as a, that the new york times story illustrated whether it's microsoft or ibm or apple the gap between the white and the black is there in the system it's not that we are working to discriminate against the african american or black it's just you know the data we have in the real product usage and the black population is around the 10% when you have 90% versus 10% there's a quality gap so because of that we have to be really um taking a special step trying to balance that gap um so this is just in the us microsoft got a, you know broad penetration on the product usage if you want to think about the worldwide uh, coverage there's a huge gap you know today And Microsoft's goal is really help everyone on the planet to achieve more, to communicate better. And uh, if you think about Azure speech and translation services, take that as example, and the OCR as well, we support about 80 locales. That's far from 7,000 languages spoken today on the planet. There are 7,000 spoken today. Oh. And there are a lot of small languages, they are dying every year. So if we as a technology service provider not do anything by the end of the century 7000 will probably be just like go half of them will be gone so to preserve the heritage 
to preserve the culture, we need to find a way to really accelerate the language expansion by utilizing transfer learning technology and uh, intelligent use of data. Maybe we can provide the incentives for people who are using the product. In return, we can actually accelerate the data collection mechanism. So whether it's Microsoft Office or Azure, we do not actually collect any data, unlike many other companies. Microsoft business model is not to sell the user to the advertiser. And to a large extent, you know, data comes into Azure, we process that, data is gone. We do, we do not touch the data at all. Because of that limit, Microsoft is actually facing more challenges to improve the AI quality. And so we are actually really developing some small app or acquire data through our partners. And but the Microsoft's main product from Teams, Office, and Azure, we do not touch data at all. So I love to see more creative suggestions from you, how we can really help to really get the quality of Indian languages. We, because we're working on 10 local Indian languages. And we have four supported today, like uh, Telugu, Tamil, and Hindi. But the, we want to actually go beyond the four like Indian languages we support on speech. Translation will support most of them. And, but the quality can be better with more data. So I'm here to actually listen, love to actually gather your feedback and a creative solution, how we can really partner together to get more data. Because in return, we are providing better quality to help our customers to, to do more. I think that's, that's very helpful, Dr. Wang. And I would, uh, you know, Simi, who heads the Nat Natural Language Processing uh, Initiative for uh, MIT, can be actually your person with whom we can work together to help you get access to better data for India. We definitely think uh, language is a big issue. Uh, you know, speech is, if we can address that issue, there is enormous opportunity to use this effectively. Shikhandi, if I can turn to you, you gave some great examples from a Indian context, but you, uh, uh, you have- uh, Sorry, Sangeeta, Sangeeta, can I quickly interrupt for a, just to yes, add please. to what yes. uh, uh, Dr. Hong was saying? So yes, IIT has very recently, uh, very recently put out uh, uh, the Indic language uh, processing suit. Uh, so uh, versions of all the, like BERT, like an Indic BERT, and so on and so forth. All the recent uh, deep learning architectures specialized for Indian languages as well as a, 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 a starter kit for Indian language, low resource language data sets. So it's already available now. And part of this work was actually done in collaboration with Microsoft Research here in Bangalore. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that uh, there has been a significant initiative and uh, so it's, it's, it's out there now. Yeah, yeah that's great. But we have to do more. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you. But I'm just saying that you so Shikant, I wanted to come to you and, you know, you talked about some great use cases from an Indian context. As you look at uh, globally, right, uh, what are some use cases that stand out for you that you think India should go out and replicate? Look, I mean, uh, I see opportunity all around us. I mean, just think about uh, the current conversation that's happening in the United States around the elections and whether the mail-in voting is fraud or fraudulent, et cetera. This is one of the most advanced countries in the world and elections are still the, the same way they've been done for 200 years, right? Uh, it, it just feels, it feels that it just doesn't, doesn't make sense. We, we should be, everybody, sh everybody should be authenticated and everybody should have one vote and they should be able to vote from their home. That's what, I mean, maybe 50 years from now, maybe 20 years from now, we will feel like it was extremely stupid of us to have not had that system that we we currently is not there anywhere. One country that's done it is Estonia. I mean, it's a small country, and they had they could start from scratch, but they could they have built a fully digital infrastructure uh, so that I mean, just imagine uh, U.S. was very quick in sending $1,200 to every citizen uh, when uh, as a check to every citizen, right? And we're also able to disperse hundreds of billions of dollars in the PPP program. Today, if you have to do that, it's not easy in India. This is a very challenging task relatively in India. So I think that there's a lot to learn from every country. Estonia as a digital transformation story is still a great example, but from an AI lens, I mean, the countries that are doing great work include uh, Canada, Israel, uh, UK, 
China, Russia, United States. There's some incredible work happening in each of these areas. And certainly India, there are great initiatives in India too, but there's something to learn from each of these countries. And uh, I think uh, I, get, I, I submit to you that in a few years from now, we'll feel like it is so antiquated. Let's look at the healthcare infrastructure. I mean, when COVID-19 hit across US, across other countries too, simply there was not a single platform that could uh, enable everything, all decisions to take place right? and to get a sense of how fast it is spreading. We were as India was as bad as anybody else in the world. Maybe we were maybe better in some some measures. Uh, so there's something to learn from everyone. Uh, but I do feel like you know the example of Estonia, though at a very small scale, if it could be done at a large scale, India has an Aadhaar example, which is great. Maybe such examples if we can just use and build on, it'll be great. Thank you, Shri. Uh, Dr. Ravindran, if you'd like to add to that on, you know, any use cases that stand out for you and, you know, how replicable will those be for India? You're on oh, mute. Sorry. I was on mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I agree with the, what uh, Shrikant was saying, right? So in every country that is... Uh, something or the other to learn from, right? So I, I can't really think of a specific uh, a specific AI use case example, uh, but there are uh, at least one thing which uh, we could talk about is uh, how the country, some of the countries have gone about in making uh, their governmental data available. This is something that Shrikant was alluding to earlier. So I think UK was in some sense a pioneer in that because they opened up a lot of their data sets way before uh, anyone else. And again, Canada is again making a lot of their data available online. So there are multi, many, many uh, countries like this from which we can take uh, uh, take our cues and then uh, open up uh, some of the data that's available. But in terms of use cases, it's just, just mind boggling what people are using AI for now. And in fact, I, I, I presume some of these have been implemented in successful fashion in, in pockets in India. Uh, for, for example, I, I heard that in, there are certain localities in Hyderabad where they actually have started issuing uh, you know, camera-based tickets traffic tickets, uh, like uh, citations for people who are speeding and so on and so forth. So, so it's, it's possible to do that, uh, 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 but at a countrywide scale, uh, India does present uh, a lot of challenges. And uh, yeah, so sure. Uh, sure. I mean, there are a lot of lessons to be learned, but I, I can't give you a specific example. Right so, so maybe I'll start the next question also with you, Dr. Ravindra. Um, I think you, you rightly spoke about the diversity of data and the the importance of responsibility that comes up with it. Now, you know, India has all these large public digital platforms that are being built on. Aadhaar is a great example. And I think as Aadhaar became much more mainstream, there were issues that were raised around, you know, how usable it is, et cetera. Um, where do you think and how do you think we should solve this conundrum of, uh, we need access to data, we need uh, to ensure it's responsible and there is no, uh, you know, no distrust or no biases in that data. Uh, but at the same time, if, if we if we can't be in a chicken and egg situation all the time, so so how do you think we should address this issue? Okay, that's that's a great question. So, um, it, it it is a challenge mainly because we don't even have a great definition of what is fair, right? So I believe that there is no universal definition of fairness. So what is fair? decision making from the same data for a particular application need not necessarily be fair for a different application, right? So I was giving you the, the, the division between rural and uh, uh, urban uh, poor, right? Maybe that is fine for certain kinds of applications. Uh, maybe that's that's not a right thing to do, but that could be other kinds of applications, maybe say healthcare, maybe credit rating, that's not the right thing to do. But if I'm going to use that for some kind of a healthcare application, right? And since the, the biological uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, composition really doesn't change. So we could always say that, uh, yeah, so whatever models you build, because you are looking at the similar kind of genomic profiles uh, should hold, right? So maybe that is the right application to use. So there should be a recognition of what exactly is the end application that you are using the data for. And the data should be audited in light of that application. So the data, to say that data should be purely unbiased, right, for whatever application you're going to use it for, that is a non-starter, right? So when, whenever you're looking for a specific application, you're picking a data set to use for that application, your data should go through some kind of an audit process 
in terms of that application. Right? So that is the way forward. Right? So that should be a good understanding of what are the characteristics of the data that would be needed for specific applications. There are, there are, uh, there's been progress made for very, very simple, very obvious biases like race, right? So people have talked about uh, uh, how you can try and make your uh, machine learning algorithm AI race blind, uh, but then the more subtle issues like genetic diversity, right? Because a drug could work for one person but not work for a slightly different population. So those kinds of things comes from understanding what is the final domain that you're putting it to use in, right? So there is this example that I'd like to quote. It turns out that uh, breast cancer drugs are more effective for women than men. And that's one of the very rare case examples where a drug is more effective for women than men. That's mainly because breast cancer is so rare in men. There are very few participants in the initial studies, right? So, uh, so the data bias always is there. I mean, we just have to recognize that it is there and, and then figure out how to audit the data in light of the final application. Thank you, Dr. Ravindran. Uh, Dr. Kwang, you know, this question is also for you, and especially in areas like speech. Um, and, you know, in a country like India, there are multiple dialects and within multiple dialects, there are multiple accents and, you know, ways on how we speak different things. Um, how do you, how do we ensure that, you know, if, uh, if there is automatic uh, translation or you know speech recognition, we are removing these biases because uh, that would be very very critical for a very very diverse country like India. Yeah, um, Microsoft actually took this uh, multi-pronged approach. So when Azure Cognitive Services were introduced, launched from day one, we provided a customer speech, for example and we provide the customer language, customer vision as a part of the services. So we believe in the ecosystem. If you are a startup in India, you have a specific domain, you can upload the data, you can just you know, take your efforts because you understand your customer scenarios better than anyone else and upload to Azure. Azure will automate this AI customization on your behalf and the data will be preserved on your behalf and the model of customized uh, services with improved quality would be owned by you. So we believe that the ecosystem plus Microsoft continuously improving the backend will actually really achieve the goal. That is the, you know, there's no better approach because nobody can participate, anticipate, and I'm sorry, not to participate, anticipate what the, the scenario is gonna be. So AI is the amplifier, right? We want AI to be used broadly with the breadth and the depth. To go deeper, we need an ecosystem. We need the developers get in the data, customize, learn, and, um, and improve. That is probably the best approach and to serve the customers. So productivity, get everyone donate data on for their own benefit. Yeah, we should all provide our voice samples to make this more effective for, for really AI to work. Shikant, you spoke about some great examples on you know, how AI was uh, leveraged for COVID-19 and there's an audience question to say, how do you ensure that we can be better prepared for the next pandemic using AI? And at the same time, uh, how should this help the, the more underprivileged sections of our society? So it's not just you know, some of the people who have access to compute facilities, but much more at a rural or underprivileged level, how can AI play a much better role for if and when there is an next pandemic? So over the last uh, few weeks, I've, a few days, I've been reading this book called uh, The Great Influenza by John M. Barry. It's a great book. It's also recommended by Bill Gates. So I finally decided to read it, even though I thought, what's the point in reading something that happened a hundred years ago, but I, I ended up reading. And I realized that there were quite a few parallels between the previous pandemic, previous global pandemic and this one. Uh, for example, the, there was this whole thing about masks, which was there. By the way, President Wilson got, got COVID like President Trump. And, and, there, and, the, there are, and you can write a whole story about the parallels. So there is a lot to learn from even something that was a hundred years old. So there is tremendous amount of things that we can learn from this instance of the pandemic. Uh, what it means is that it's not definitely the last pandemic we will have. They will have, there will be other pandemics which are driven by influenza-like viruses, 
uh, or you know coronaviruses and so on that there could be more uh, and there could be other kinds of pandemics too so one of the things that we have we have realized in this is the, uh, the is connecting for example nobody every hospital is planning its own capacity its own system but there was no planning at a state or a city or a local level right it is just simply not there this thing this need for hospitals to connect with each other was never felt but now we know that if if it, all the healthcare capacity in our country could be connected to each other and actually there is a unique health id for every every individual for example this could make a huge difference if we could have electronic health records uh, that could give us understanding of the um, potential uh, pre pre existing conditions and, and and other you know comorbidities and so on it would be very helpful if you could if you could connect when you take a look at when you think of a pandemic right what exactly happened at that point of time how do you know, we had you know need for prior personal protective equipment and so on stockpiling some of those might help us in in preventing some of that from, but from an ai and data lens i think connecting all the systems and being upfront and and actually even tracking even a few cases somewhere could be the starting point even i mean what what one of the things that ai algorithms did point to very early in the in the pandemic i mean which which means december 2019 not 2020 in december 2019 there were people were picking up news around about a potential uh, virus that was floating around in china there are some pockets that the, the things were being picked up so ai was able to spot it early so we can spot something early we can fit, you know create the capacity that is required connect all the data sets and then even even finding a cure for example if you look at a vaccine or clinical trials many of the some of the acceleration in the clinical trials is because of some of the ai that is being used some of the uh, drug drug research is happening because what they did was they looked at a coronavirus protein and they said did a very quick ai search to find out other proteins that might be able to bind to them and and therefore prevent the spread so they could do these kinds of searches because of ai algorithms so if you if you just have a pandemic preparedness plan which includes some of these elements we can certainly uh, you know see a pandemic early in its in its in its evolution and even make sure that the effect is not as severe as it is this time great point uh, dr huang i have an audience question for you which is really talking about how could natural language processing be leveraged in the context of a public health emergency so she can't spoke about the data side of it i think this is more from the context of nlp how can that help in a public health emergency and uh, can you actually the audio was not uh, clear can you repeat so the, the question yeah so the question is really how can natural language processing be leveraged in the context of a public health emergency um yeah um language is really the way people communicate right Uh, I want to actually uh, share a few examples how Microsoft Azure cognitive services were used to fight uh, COVID-19, and this just all happened in the last the few months. Got rapidly deployed. The best example is uh, CDC. This is the the U.S. authority about the you know what how we actually deal with the COVID-19, and there's a health spot Q and A. you know but that really helped answer lots the lots of questions related to covid-19 which was powered by azure ai so that was one example how natural language really helped another example is in italy you know a few months ago it was really very very stressful for the country so the italian national post office actually deployed this uh, voice answering system people can call that the service using azure ai to answer lots of questions related to the the country's specific challenges and uh, another one is really, is really ahs this is national health services in the united kingdom they use microsoft azure ai to validate the identity of the user through facial recognition and in in the us for high school kids and the form ocr recognition of azure ai services actually helped the uh, ap test and you know they can actually really do take the ap test we can validate and uh, recognize what is being written on the paper so throughout the world from europe to us ai is really here and it's real 
and whether it's natural language or speech or computer vision, um, is just you know helping the society dealing better with this uh, pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Huang. I have a question for Dr. Ravindran from the audience, uh, which is really talking about, um, are there any risks, malfe malfeasance, uh, fraud, data security, bias, implicit in utilizing data and AI to power financial services? Hmm. Okay. Uh, the short answer? Yes, <laughs> right. Uh, but the answer is, uh, as always, as always, the answer is not that uh, that simple, right? So, um, so irresponsible use of data could could give rise to all kinds of issues. In fact, there was a, uh, a story. I'm not sure how how uh, true it is uh, in Bangalore about a, an IBM employee being denied a loan uh, because he was living in a low income neighborhood. Right, so the banks were using uh, all, some kind of a decision making, whether it was AI or whether it was plain old statistical analysis, and then they had decided to flag these uh, neighborhoods, uh, these pin codes as uh, you know being high risk, right? And uh, so, so there are there are uh, these kinds of uh, biases and uh, other uh, other kinds of uh, you know unfair practices that could potentially come into play because of AI. So there are two things that I would like to point out here. One, uh, the usual excuse trotted out by the AI people is because, hey, the data is biased, right? So you are giving me biased data to train on and you are expecting the system to be unbiased. Right? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, the problem with the biased AI system is the following, right? When a human is in the decision-making loop, the biases vary among humans, right? It's not like it is not system systematized. So it does not become systemic bias, right? But then when I say that I'm going to take the human out of the loop and I'm going to replace that with the AI in this, this kind of decision making, you could call them routine decision making, but you're replacing it with the AI. Then in some sense, you're making the biases in the AI system systemic, right? And that is one part of it. The second part of it is something I'm, I'm, I'm actually now quoting from an article by uh, Professor Subarao Kambambati. Uh, the second part of it is, is humans tend to trust machines more than they trust other humans when it comes to making impartial decisions. And if you say that the machine is making a decision, the human trust level goes up a little bit, right? And they, they are more loath to question the machine decisions. I'm not talking about the person who's getting affected at the end. I'm talking about that other people in the organization who are going to say that, oh no, it was not a human who made the decision. It was a machine that made the decision. Therefore, it is more likely to be correct. The machine is impartial. It is not swayed by whether the person was crying in front of my desk, applying for a loan or not, right? So, so there are a whole bunch of societal issues that are going to creep in when I'm going to say that I'm building biased AI system. And really, the excuse that the data is biased and therefore my AI system is biased really doesn't get us out of it here. Right? So especially when you're talking about domains that affect people directly, like financial services or in healthcare, right? So you really have to be cognizant of the fact that you could be building something that's very, very dangerous. But having said that, doesn't mean that you shouldn't use AI. You should. It's just that you should be aware of what is it that you are building. Right? You can't. You can't think of it as an un infallible machine. Thank you so much, Shrikant. The next question is for you, really, which is saying much of India's agricultural products are spoiled in transit and never end up reaching consumers. How can AI help to alleviate issues surrounding the agriculture supply chain? Great. Um, absolutely. Uh, maybe if I could, uh, I would certainly like to answer that question. Maybe if I could add a little bit to Dr. Ravindran's answer on the sure. previous question, which is a very important topic. Uh, on the on the financial services side, there is, look, every companies are just maximizing profits, right? Eventually a financial services firm's goals could be maximizing profit. Fairness is not necessarily a criterion unless it's regulated. So for example, US had a Fair, Fair Credit Reporting Act, which said, you cannot deny uh, credit to anyone. If you're denying credit to anyone, you have to provide three statistically valid reasons to do so, uh, which is which is one of the one of the uh, one of the rules. Right? For example, the, there's uh, one rule that if you are beyond a certain age, then people younger than you should not have a higher probability of getting the loan than you. 
right? There's there's a protection for age. So these kinds of protections have to be inbuilt. Otherwise, the system might just optimize only one thing it knows, which is maximize the chances of making profit, right? How do I repayment probability, et cetera. The second point I'd like to say is where the AI is trained. Because every time, if you're denying credit in the past, that experience the, the system won't have because the system learns only from the people who have been granted credit and how they perform over, the, over, the, over, over a period of time. If they've never been granted credit, we don't know their performance. And therefore, that's another area which has to be sort of balanced out when you're building fair models. The last point I want to mention, actually, there are two more points. One more point is around pricing. Right? You may say, look, I'm giving everybody the same. I'm, I'm, I'm giving everybody the loan, but I could be differentially pricing it out. I could be differential pricing somebody versus the other and, and people I like versus or people who are willing to pay. Right? I might even look at things like who's willing to, who's credit needy. If, it's, if she is credit needy, I can charge a higher interest rate. Now, is that there has to be a regulatory framework which either allows it or doesn't allow it. I'm not necessarily uh, hung up on the ethics of this, but uh, I, the, it is an important question that needs to be answered. And the last point I would say is even just what you advertise, because today we all see what we want to see, right? What the advertiser wants to show to you. They know exactly who the customer is. Let's say you and I can get the same loan, except that you never see the a click link for that loan, right? You never see the ad for that loan. I do. So even just not, we may have exactly a fair process, but it may be targeting only some set of people. So the, you can also test the ethics of that. So the, it is a vastly complicated topic, there, but there are many layers of this, this topic. And now coming back to the, sorry for that long answer, and coming back to the supply chain, uh, supply chain question. Um, look, I think India, so roughly 50% of the production of food grains and food around the world gets wasted, 50%. That's the statistic. Uh, in the developed world, developed world, a lot of that is what is left in the refrigerator. It's just wasted because it's not been used. In India, a lot of this is because there is not a cold chain. The supply chain is actually is quite uh, you know not very good. It means that we have not planned the, uh, the, the supply chain properly. We have not been able to estimate demand. Uh, we, have not been, we don't have the adequate infrastructure to uh, to transport it, we don't. Uh, you know, there are delays in, uh, on the shipment. Uh, there's so th there is there's several infrastructure and supply chain, supply chain infrastructure type of reasons, right? And some of them are are around demand forecasting, supply forecasting, uh, and uh, making sure that the the right right products are reaching the right destination at the right time. That is a problem that AI can easily solve, right? It can you can easily tell you know which if you have if you have all these production in, in that's happening, how much to produce and how much of that to distribute to which locations to get the best price and to maximize throughput, I think that's something AI can definitely solve for. Thank you, Srikant. Uh, Dr. Huang, uh, Dr. Huang, my next question is for you really on, uh, you know, this is an audience question, which is really asking, uh, you know, in the field of natural language processing, how do you see what are the major applications from an Indian context, if you can contextualize to India, uh, be leveraged for? And which are these applications that can really represent the bottom of the pyramid for India? Because we have a lot of people who are, you know, not in such great conditions and, you know, people who may not have access to digital infrastructure. Well, I think the language is going to be one of the most important uh, means for the country because the diversity of the language, like the European Union, and uh, they put a huge emphasis to bring citizens closer to the government. And that's why European Parliament is investing to get this live translation, in the debate, in the speech, et cetera, translated into 24 language, languages. Um, in India, I believe the mobile phone is um, so dominant and uh, mobile phone is really the device that is designed for people to talk. And the language is a means to help to enhance that. And I know the setup box um, in India is powered by Microsoft Azure today. So you can actually really order the movie program um, from the geo setup box in either Hindi or English. And I believe moving forward, we should just enable citizens of India to really communicate in their own native language. And uh, Microsoft Azure AI can play a role to support that vision. It's so broad. It's just, you know, 
can, can you imagine the possibility you are not able to really speak your own language? You have, you have the barrier. Thank you, Dr. Huang. Uh, Dr. Ravindran, I have two questions for you, so I'll just read them together. Uh, one is saying, could you explain in detail what database identification and neutralization would look like in a real life scenario? And the second question is really, is it possible to crowdsource perspectives and concerns from end beneficiaries to understand potential biases in data, especially those coming from bottom of the pyramid? Sorry, uh, Sankita, I didn't get your second question. Uh, so, the, so the second question is, can you crowdsource? Me. Sorry, can you hear me better? Yeah, yeah, much better. So, yeah. So the second question is, can you crowdsource perspectives and concerns from end beneficiaries to understand potential biases in data? Huh. Okay, so let me take the second question first, because it's slightly easier to answer. Uh, to some extent, yes, you can. Uh, but largely, uh, the end beneficiaries do not understand what AI can do for them. What is it exactly that people are doing when they do AI? I mean, for many people, AI is just a black box. In fact, we have just, just before the pandemic hit, we started a project at IIT Madras to actually understand what is a, what is a non- AI, not non technical person's perspective of AI is, right? And given that there's so much noise being made about AI being used in healthcare, so we started this project focusing on the healthcare sector, like trying to go to talk to doctors, you know, to technicians and to patients, right? And trying to understand what do they think that AI can do for them, right? And I, I, the people are way off the mark, right? I mean, no, 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 they don't really understand what is it that, uh, you know, AI is going to accomplish for them. Right. So if you're going to crowdsource opinions about, you know, concerns, right, you, you, would, uh, yeah, you would get a lot of concerns because people are always concerned about uh, AI, right? I mean, thanks to uh, 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 things going back to the 60s about um, AI as a menace, uh, uh, picturization in the society. So people are always concerned about AI. Uh, but I don't know if you will get the truly meaningful and addressable concerns just by purely crowdsourcing it to the end users right so i think that is that is an issue but you will you will kind of you know understand what are people apprehensive about and you can put in measures to address those that to allay their fears and i'm not sure whether that is going to actually figure out uh, what are the uh, the hidden sources of biases and more subtle uh, uh, errors that can be introduced by ai system right so this is the answer to the second part of the question. And to the first part of the question, which I believe was, uh, is there a way to systematically identify biases from data that has been gathered and how to uh, uh, redress them, right? Um, there have been attempts that are being made, right? And uh, so, for example, uh, people talk about uh, things like protected attributes, right? So, and then they say that uh, uh, when, when I build a system, right, with regard to this protected attribute, the system should be neutral. Right? In some sense, the, the protected attribute should not be used for making decisions. Like for example, something like gender. Right? I, should not, I should not be using gender to make, say, lending decisions. Right? Um, uh, for example, in insurance, we, people do use gender as a surrogate for whether you are a safe driver or not. Right? But if you say gender is a protected attribute, you should be looking only at driving behavior and not necessarily at, at gender as a shortcut for uh, uh, looking at that, right? So you basically have to look at other signals. So in in places where you can define these kinds of, uh, you know, uh, what is it that with respect to which you want to be fair? I mean, you can you can go around, go around and look for systemic uh, biases. In other cases, uh, it has to be a iterative process. You can't just look at the data and figure out whether it is biased. You have to start building models with the data, and then test the model for bias, right? and then and then figure out, hey, maybe it's being caused by either the data bias or maybe there is an algorithmic bias that is creeping in and that is causing this outcome, right? So uh, you, you would have to go back and fix it in that case, okay? So this is in, in particular the AI. I mean, there are other domains where people have been worried, about, especially in the social sciences uh, sector, people have been worried about biases for a long time, right? And they have other ways of inherently controlling for bias, even when they are doing data gathering. But when you're talking about the large gamut of applications which AI can be applied, in many, many domains, you don't have such uh, uh, well-defined principles in place. In such cases, you'd have to do this in a trade I think we are almost out of time. I've been getting multiple things. So I'll just request each of the panelists to give us a quick uh, closing comment. Shrika, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, thank you, Sangeeta. 
I think we've had a very uh, productive, healthy discussion. Uh, the net of this is that AI and data are extraordinarily powerful sources of creating wealth, creating growth, unlocking innovation, and really creating the country that we want to create. It isn't going to happen. There is no magic wand to create the growth and the kinds of the, the, the aspirations that we have of our, from our country, right? For example, if you want to get rid of tuberculosis in our country, it's not going to happen without AI. If you, if any major problem around the world, if you think of that, we need uh, great data, great AI algorithms, and even a great way to design how to solve those problems. And that's the that is a part of every solution. And if India gets very serious about AI and unlocks its data, we can create that uh, we can create that future that we are all aspiring towards. Thank you. Thank you, Sri Lanka. Dr. Kwan? Uh, yeah, AI is just, you know, the really new electricity, I think, that um, would transform the whole society in a profound way. I would say for India, the language barrier, like the European Union, is one of the biggest opportunity for the country. The societal impact will be so profound. If we can really reach that state, people can freely communicate and you can reach almost every citizen in the country, that this will bring the country closer and move forward together. So I, I hope that Microsoft Azure AI can partner with the company in India, really fulfill that dream. We can communicate freely without barriers. Thank you. Um, Professor Ravindran. So I, I agree with the, both the, the panelists' closing comments in the sense that AI is, is a very transformative technology, right? And when we talk about using AI to solve India's problems, right? It's not like we are building new algorithms or new solution approaches for solving India's problem. It basically is going to look at whatever is the best solutions out there, right? regardless of uh, country, and applying it to India's data. Right? So in some sense, uh, the only way forward for us is like Shrikant was saying, making sure that our data is available for us to build solutions on top of it and, and do so in a, in, a, in a responsible fashion. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate Shrikant, Professor Ravindran, Dr. Huan for your time, for your patience. Uh, all our participants who despite the technical glitch have stayed with us and sent us a large number of questions, many of which we could not answer. Uh, but I just want to summarize with a few things that I picked up from this session. One is clearly, um, I think we all recognize that AI is a transformative technology, whether it's the new electricity, whether it's what internet was 10 years back. It is something that is going to be very, very critical for India's future. And it's important that we put in all effort to make this real for India. The second is uh, we need access to data. We need all the right uh, programs and uh, uh, you know, initiatives to come together that bring the value of data or unlocks the value of data, but we need to do it responsibly. So there is, uh, there is no way of saying that, you know, just because we are in a hurry to get something done, we can live with biases. That for a country as diverse as India just does not work. Third, I think, is really the whole importance on language. Uh, I think Dr. Huang said this very, very well, that, uh, you know, multiple languages can help address many of the issues, and especially for a country like India, that is uh, where digital will, is mobile first. Uh, more investment in natural language processing and multilingual solutions can play a key role for India to be able to harness its digital journey that we have seen until now. So thank you all for all uh, for your session, for being patient with us. I uh, really, really appreciate your time. And I'm going to hand this back to Sydney from here. Thank you, Sangeeta, for uh, such a wonderful moderation of the session. And it has been really interactive and bringing out the best of the thoughts and ideas from all the speakers. Uh, integrating data from all various sources and using it innovatively will unleash disruptive improvements. And we know that this will improve substantially the performance across socioeconomic indicators. We realize that data is a strategic asset yet to be optimally tapped, but with the right governance mechanisms put in place, data analytics and processing will lead to development of more innovative solutions to the societal problems. So by unlocking data with the necessary safeguards and responsibilities, innovation will get accelerated. Opportunities in the global economy would be increasing. Immense value generation would take place. Better public service deliveries would occur. 
product design and productivity both would increase, leading to inclusion and empowerment. I thank the distinguished speakers of this session for benefiting us with their thoughts, with their ideas, and uh, these would surely act as the guiding principles to all the stakeholders in the domain towards optimum and productive use of data towards the larger goal of ensuring responsible AI for social empowerment. Thank you very much for taking time out to participate in this session, Ms. Rama, Dr. Wong, Professor Ravindran, Mr. Srikant, and Ms. Sangeeta, and for making it a big success. I would also like to thank all the participants who have joined us in the session today from all across. I'm sure you would have had a very interesting and uh, you would have really enjoyed being with their, us here and would have found the session useful. Thanks also to the organizing team for all the backend support in running this session. It was a pleasure for me to host this session today. Greetings to all. Namaste.